From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Gua. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. China's population grew by only 480,000 in 2021. That is the lowest growth figure in decades. China is hardly alone. Slowing population growth is not unique to China. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the world's population increased by 74 million in 2021. That is a 0.9 percent population growth rate, and it fell short of expectations. How can we make sense of all these figures? Today, I'm very happy to be joined by Mr. Du Peng in Beijing. He's the vice president of Renmin University, and he's an expert on aging and population studies. Um, president Du, thank you for joining us at this hour. What do you make of China's uh, figures, uh, the lowest uh, population growth uh, in decades? Okay, in fact, uh, uh, nobody expected uh, China will keep growing of the population. So uh, many projections uh, estimate in the next uh, several years, we will have a zero growth. So currently the low uh, birth rates means we are entering the zero growth zone. So maybe next year or in the coming two or three years, we can have a negative or uh, a little bit of positive growth. But uh, generally, we are stopping the growth of the total population. Do we know about the replacement of China? Because uh, when it comes to population studies, a replacement rate is a very uh, important figure. You know, the people that die, that pass away, uh, versus the, the new births. Uh, what do we know about China's replacement rate uh, for the year 2021? Okay, it's about 1.2 uh, or exactly about 1.15 uh, for the total fertility What does rate. that mean? Uh, that means uh, if uh, uh, we assume the current cohort of uh, uh, female, they uh, experience their childbearing of the whole period from 15 years old to 49 years old. The average number they are expected to have the children, that's the total fertility rate. Uh, in, uh, generally, we, we say 2.1 is the replacement level. That means if a couple have uh, two children and the two children grow up to their 20s, they can replace the number of their parents. So if we are lower than 2.1, we mean we are under repla replacement level. We were there in 1992. So in the past three decades, we are already in low fertility rates. So China's replacement rate, uh, like you said, is 1.2% or around that figure, below the 2% uh, figure that is an ideal figure. How does China's replacement rate compare with its neighboring countries and the rest of the world? Yeah, uh, in East Asia, we are still a little bit higher than Korea and Japan. Korea has been the lowest country uh, in the world in the past two years. The, the TFR is about 1.1. We are just a little bit higher than that. Japan is around 1.2. Okay, you know, addressing international concerns, uh, Western media often have simplistic narratives of, of China. You know, many uh, Western headlines uh, read like this, will China grow old before it gets rich? Of course, that is a very simplistic way to look at things, but uh, to address their concern, will China grow old before it gets rich? Yeah, I think that concept was true uh, 20 years ago, but now we are hardly to see we are still getting old while getting rich. We already cross over that phase. We should say we are getting old while getting rich at this phase. So comparing two decades ago, per capita uh, GDP, and also the universal coverage of social security, and also the long-term care services, uh, such progress, especially the education, help us to cross that term. All right, so China realizes that its population dwindling is a huge issue, uh, a burden on social security, something you've just touched upon, but also on China's potential labor force 
uh, the dynamism of uh, Chinese economy. So the Chinese government has issued uh, the so-called three children policy not so long ago, encouraging Chinese couples to have more babies. What do you make of this three children policy? Do you think there, you know, this policy is enough? Uh, I think that's a, a more uh, positive uh, policy to encourage the young couples to have more children. But it, it doesn't play very important role in the total birth number because the, the fundamental issue currently is how to help the young couples to have the first baby and especially for those who want to have two children can realize their ideal uh, number of uh, childbearing. And then the last part is the three children policy. Uh, in the past uh, six, seven months, we already had the national policy. It takes some longer time to, uh, to see the impact from the three children policy. If you read the figures, most of the newborns in 2021 are the second child. Uh, not so many of them come from the first child, uh, let alone the third child. So new measures are already in place in the pipelines to hopefully give Chinese couples more financial and material incentives. What would you see as the most important um, incentives for Chinese couples to have more babies going forward? Okay. We can see that from two points. The first, uh, in the past two decades, people thought, or, or maybe from the policy side, uh, assumed that uh, the, the policy will play an important role when we have a two children policy or three children policy, and then we will have a, definitely have a higher fertility rate. But now we can realize that uh, it's not just the policy, but how to solve the basic issues of uh, child care and also the, the high uh, cost of uh, living, uh, especially for housing, and also whether we have uh, uh, equal uh, access to the high quality education, they play more important role than the policy itself. So that's the incentives come uh, more and more from that perspective. Uh, and also currently, I think, uh, even for three children policy and some uh, uh, educational or uh, other incentives, they, it, it's too short time to see the full impact. But the direction is very correct. If we can continue to have these concrete measures to help these young couples, we can stabilize or we can stop the rapid decline of the birth rates. You know, let's talk about child care and education. Uh, for example, you know, daycare in China is very expensive in big cities. Um, you know, I have a two-year-old, and uh, in Beijing, uh, you know, she will not qualify for public kindergarten unless and until she is three years old. And uh, the birthday is also matters. She has to be born, uh, you know, before September the first. But uh, she happened to be born in October, which means she cannot, uh, you know, attend a public Chinese kindergarten. And the Beijing government realizes that, for example, saying that those aged between two to three uh, should qualify for a kindergarten. Um, do you think, you know, cities in China should really promote policies such as this uh, so that uh, the burdens on parents, on young couples can be reduced? Yeah, I think that's the direct, uh, right direction, especially in the last year. Many cities, they have uh, uh, more kindergartens, so, and also they try to have a rotating system for the uh, school teachers so that they can have an equal quality of the different uh, schools. But uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, enough by the current effort. Uh, if they can keep in that direction to make more efforts, I think in the coming one or two years, we, we will see it's, it's not uh, difficult uh, obstacle for many young couples uh, and then people will realize it's not a huge burden for their child bearing. And also housing is a big issue facing Chinese young couples. The government realizes that as well. You know, tax deductions are being talked about, uh, affordable housing, uh, lowering of the rent, you know, lowering of mortgages, stabilizing the property prices are all being talked about and uh, some of those policies are already in place. Whose problem is that uh, for the, the high property prices? How can really Chinese couples afford uh, more 
and cheaper and more affordable houses. Uh, nowadays, the efforts to solve the problem uh, coming from two perspectives. One from the government side, try to have more uh, renting, uh, uh, more houses for, for leasing. So the young couples don't need to pay a, a, a big number of mortgage to purchase their private housing at the very early stage of their career. And then the second is uh, try to subsidize these young couples if they they can have a one or two children and to have a, to give them more support, financial support, uh, including the taxation uh, reduction from that side. But uh, uh, we have some pilot policies in the past year or even longer than that, especially in some eastern cities. But it's not still it's not universal policy and uh, uh, still need more efforts to to push forward on that direction. Right, and then on the other end, we have an aging population, an aging society, and in recent years, many governments, for example, in Western countries, have been promoting this so-called gray economy, and this industry is also um, booming in many cities in China. Is that a good thing? I mean, uh, how can China really tap onto the, you know, aging population, if you will, and uh, make it work? Mm -hmm. Uh, if we see the the population figure last year, in fact, the two increasing proportion and one uh, reducing proportion, then the middle part of the uh, working uh, population is a little bit decreasing, but the aging uh, increased about five percentages. And the other side is the children proportion, a little bit increased about one percentage. So uh, uh, in, uh, we are entering the rapid aging stage, that phase from this year, because 60 years ago, we entered the rapid, uh, the largest birth boom in 1962. And this year, we will, we will have more than one, uh, 15 million retire, retired persons for the first uh, old boom, senior boom. So in the next uh, uh, 10 years, we will see about 50 million increase of the retirees. And then, uh, as you mentioned, the green economy, like in other developed countries, is a big part for the economy, economic development in the aging society. So the national policy last year already focused on that, try to encourage the development of the green economy especially to to uh, mention to give them sensitives uh, at least to keep them they pro while they are providing services but they can pro uh, make profit from that so that more and more companies or uh, organizations they will join the green economic supply uh, but uh, comparing to the increasing population aging uh, still, it's quite a uh, uh, very early stage to, uh, to boom the green economy. One more question about China's uh, you know, population decline that is uh, you know, uh, on females. Uh, why Chinese women, less Chinese women, uh, are willing to get married and give birth? To babies, uh, is there a correlation between how well off a society is and the number of new births? Uh, if you look at some developed societies in Western Europe and North America, population has been declining uh, over the past few decades. But uh, if you look at some, uh, you know, uh, emerging economies, emerging markets in Latin America and across the Middle East. Uh, population growth is still there. How can this inform and enlighten China's current situation? Uh, in fact, we, can, we have uh, some similar uh, reasons or similar uh, factors uh, uh, for our uh, birth rate in, in other countries like developed countries, but also we have our unique reasons uh, to explain that. The common parts include with the rapid economic and the social developments. In fact, we have a much better uh, pension system. People will not rely on their children to support their old age. And then they will change their uh, ex expectation to more children. 
The second, because we have a much better education, uh, more, uh, more and more people, they, they, will, uh, uh, they will graduate from the universities. So when we talk about the bigger, last year, uh, we need to notice, although the birth number declined to about 10,000, uh, 10, 10 million, at the same time, this year, we will have more than 10 million graduates from the universities. So comparing to that, we uh, in the labor force, in fact, uh, every year, the new labor force, the majority of them, they graduated from universities already. The longer education years will postpone their uh, age to get married, especially to have the first child. The similar reason in other developed countries play important role for lowering the birth rates. And also we have uh, uh, some unique reasons for China. The first, uh, we have a uh, uh, very high uh, labor force participation rate for females in right. China. So, uh, and, and then if we, uh, we encourage them to have two children or to have three children, even we give them three years for one child bearing. But after six years or nine years, it's very difficult for them to be competitive in their career development than the males. So they need more policy uh, support. I, I mean that comparing to Japan, the majority of the, the females after they are childbearing, maybe they spend, spend a lot of years at home. The second unique reason in China is we have a huge number of migrants. We call that floating population. Uh, it's quite different comparing to other countries. That means many young people, they left behind their hometown, their housing property. Yeah. And then they have to purchase, or maybe they have to spend a lot of money to rent their housing in the cities. It's more difficult for them comparing to other developed countries, uh, I mean, higher cost for childbearing or even for their career development. So we put that together, we will see uh, why it's so difficult for them to get married and also so difficult to have two children. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it's, it's not just the policy to say, okay, we encourage you to have three children, but how to solve the fundamental issues they, they are facing every day so that they can uh, have an easier life and, uh, and then they can realize their ideal number of child barriers. Yeah, I'm uh, reminded of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of demands, uh, whereby you've got to have enough food and uh, basic security, uh, food on the table before uh, you would want other things. Um, now, it is a very interesting topic, uh, a multifaceted issue. I want to ask you, uh, President Du, about, uh, you know, really the role of culture and social norms in, you know, uh, deciding how many children a society have. For example, if you look at some Catholic, largely Catholic societies in Latin America, um, figures say that they tend to have more babies. Uh, across the Muslim world in the Middle East, uh, you know, many of those societies tend to have more babies. And uh, in Western Europe and North America, on the other hand, uh, they tend to have less babies, at least in the last two decades or three decades. It, what role do cultures and customs and norms play in a society's population growth? Uh, I, I think the most important factor is not the culture. Still, it's uh, social economic development because to some stage of the development, then the culture will be changed. Like Middle East, uh, after uh, several decades development, uh, especially in some ca countries there, and then you will see uh, even today, they have a much lower fertility rates comparing to 20 years ago. When we talk about Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic culture, in fact, uh, typical Catholic countries like uh, Italy, like Spain, they also have the lowest fertility rates in the world. Italy is also about 1.2, 1.3, same as uh, Spain, Spain. Right, right, right. Um, you know, even though, for example, Argentina and Brazil and, uh, you know, Venezuela, Cuba, and Italy uh, are all Catholic countries, but 
due to different economic uh, development stages yeah. and they have different birth rates. Fair enough. President Du, now let's look at the world. China is not alone uh, when it comes to uh, aging population and declining birth rates. Uh, the fact is the world's population grew by only 74 million in 2020. One and uh, according to the UN data, global population is expected to peak before 2100. That is uh, still a few decades from here. What does this all mean for the world in general, especially for the, for the world's economy? Okay, generally the fertility rates in the whole world is declining, but comparing to developed the world, the still the biggest share of the increase the growth uh, come from the developing countries, especially in Southeast Asia uh, countries and also from Africa. So the more than 40% growth in the next decades will come from Africa. Uh, but for African countries, their fertility rates, they are decreasing also. And in Asia, even for India, they have much higher uh, fertility rate comparing to Eastern uh, Asian countries. But last year, for the first time, even for India, they reached the replacement level. They are 2.1. So uh, when we forecast the future increase uh, in the next 80 years, we can see we will have a more population in developing countries uh, and uh, fewer population in the developed world in, uh, and also including China. The biggest challenge for that means in for developed world will be the population aging. How to keep the sustainable developments while have uh, uh, facing the aging issues of fewer labor force. But for develop, developing countries, still they need to most uh, they need more services for uh, reproductive health and in fact uh, to increase the education uh, input in those countries. And in the, in the end, all countries will have a lower fertility rate. Every country will have a population aging in soon or later in the future. You know, you talk about the developed world, uh, countries like Germany and Japan, they have been scrambling to have solutions for this population issue. Uh, some of them come up with solutions either by opening their borders to immigrants or by focusing heavily on science and technology. And in other parts of the world, particularly in Southeast Asia and Africa, fertility rates, it's uh, still higher than average. What major demographic shifts do you anticipate in the next uh, few decades? We will have more older persons in the developed world. So that's the, we have to divide that to two parts. But for developing countries uh, with the biggest share of the population increase, they will face the challenge to provide the youth more health uh, services and more educational opportunities and also uh, job opportunities to solve the aging issues uh, in European countries. In fact, the, the, uh, for European uh, Union, they have a floating population. The labor force can uh, share the working uh, the job markets, but. In the other end, like Japan, Korea, they they can't have the similar uh, policies. So, uh, and then the common part is you have to depend on the tech science and the technology developments. I think that's the most efficiency uh, way to solve the the strengthen the economic power in the future. Um, any final thoughts, President Du, on what China can do to really? Uh, you know, uh, resolve or come to terms with its population growth decline issue? For China, it's very unique because we, although we are talking about the population uh, possible zero growth in the near future, but still we have a 1.4 billion population. It's a still a big market. And then uh, even we are talking about the labor force, the labor force is uh, still more than 880 million still the biggest uh, in the world. So in the future, I think one point is we have to keep the, uh, the services, the sensitive policies to help the young people. For those who want to have a child, who want to have a two or three children to, to realize their ideal birth number, 
So I, I think that's the fundamental policy. The second, we have to shift to the to uh, depend on the science and the technology development. Shift uh, because we have the background to have a much better educational system. We have more than 10 million graduates from the universities in the, every year in the coming years. So we can shift to technology intensive development. The third is we have to, uh, we already have the universal uh, pension system and also the health insurance system. They are the biggest in the world. But for the next part, we still have to narrow the gap between the urban and the rural to have a more equal access for these kind of services, especially across the urban and the rural areas, uh, to to make every uh, not just the old persons. If the old persons they can uh, have these services, and then they are young couples, will release they will have an easier life uh, for their own family, small family, to have uh, more children to have their family dream. Mr. Du Peng, Vice President of Renmin University, thank you very much for your insight and thank you for joining us on The Hub on CGTN today. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub. If you have any comments or suggestions about our show, feel free to contact me on social media. Thank you for joining us at this hour. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues on CGTN. Bye for now.